Okay, awesome. So Josh is going to share his screen and pull up his presentation and all his code and we're going to dive into it and then you can ask him questions. Um, Josh, do you have a preference on how you want questions? You want to save them for the end? You want to put them in the chat? Do you want people to just jump in? Yeah, so I have a bunch of topics I'm moving between, so I'll try and remember to ask for questions. Okay. In. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about how the talk's going to work as I go. So there'll be okay. some talk and then uh, with overview of different things, and there'll be some time to look at how it works in an actual plugin. Um, so, and that would be great question and answer time. Uh, okay. So thanks for having me, Renee. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, this is the first time I'm giving this talk, so I um, appreciate any feedback anybody has uh, on this. Um, the talk is Modern WordPress Plugin Development Toolset. Uh, and I am Josh Pollock. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, this talk is a lot of my my biases, my uh, like my opinions on what the tools are, what you should use. Um, I've been doing WordPress development for about eight years now, and it's been my way of learning PHP and JavaScript development. So I do a lot of Laravel, React, WordPress type development, uh, all this stuff. Um, I've worked for uh, the companies that build Ninja Forms, Caldera Forms, Pods, I worked at 10 Up, um, and I'm currently working on something called Plugin Machine, um, which we'll look at more in the second part of this talk. Um, and Plugin Machine should be like launched by then. Um, but this is part one, and most of the code was built with Plugin Machine. It's a tool for uh, plugin developers, so it generates code for you and adds features to your plugin. Um, so this was a cool way to play with that. Uh, this talk is for people who write PHP and JavaScript for WordPress. Um, so I don't wanna just like say like WordPress developers, some people do are really great at like Elementor and Page Builder and this stuff. I'm not, um, totally different skill. Um, but that's who this is kind of for though, is PHP and JavaScript developers. And kind of aimed at plugin developers, I think this applies to site development and, as, and to theme development as well. Um, these next few slides have a link to the to the slides themselves um, on the internet. Um, I really recommend opening it up on your own screen. Like the link's also in the chat here. It's in my way to done, like my Twitter and stuff. Um, if you're watching this later, um, but like there's a lot of links, uh, and that's part of what's uh, important here in this talk. But we're going to be talking about what is WordPress made of real quick. And then what do we use to make those things? Um, and I'm gonna go through all the different parts of the stack, different tools, and give you my opinion, where to look, some examples, um, and a lot of example code, but I want you to have all the links to know where to look, because that's part of the challenge, I think, with this, is knowing what is the thing you're supposed to be using um, and having the right information about it. So, these slides are just filled, filled with links and you can't touch my screen. Um, you know, due to social distancing, so you can do it uh, from your. Um, <laughs> this is the last link, the uh, one that has the slides in it, um, but you can get that in the chat. Um, and uh, then you can click like to the GitHub repo that had for these slides, if you want to correct my typos. And there's also this example code here, uh, which I'll be at the second half of the talk be looking through. Um, so just to sort of start with like, what are we playing with here? WordPress isn't, you know, it's a stack. Like there's a bunch of different technologies being used together in different places to make a WordPress. Um, you know, a lot of what happens in a WordPress happens in the browser. It's client side, JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. So that's part of the stack. And that's not something we have, you know, control over. Um, per se, um, but we need to control for, we need to optimize for the browser, even though we don't know what the browser is. Um, we also have a server. This is a server that if we build the WordPress itself, we can have control over it for plugin developers. We can make some educated opinions about, um, but this is a server with PHP on it uh, that generates HTML and CSS and JavaScript. And, um, there might be more complicated server stack involved in hosting, you know, in a host environment, you'd have Redis or Memcached or, you know, Apache or Nginx, a lot of stuff, but that's optional stuff. The minimum is like, 
you have a web browser and server, and then a database server. MySQL is the language that uh, we use for the WordPress database. So those are like the three basic components. The client, which runs the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The server, which runs PHP and possibly other things. Uh, and the database, which is what MySQL database and stores you know, the information about the post. Part of this um, stack is now React. So that's going to be a, a big part of when we talk about the tool set of plugin development is this optional-ish part of it, which is React. Uh, React is a user interface library built by Facebook, uh, so open source. Uh, it's used in the block editor, but we could use it for building admin pages. So it's not just about extending blocks, like building our own blocks or extending core blocks, but it's also, um, you know, we can have a little mini React app as our settings page for our plugins. Jetpack does this, WooCommerce does this. Tons of plugins do this because it's you know, a little interactive application, very good UI. Um, and um, we can also do the front end of the website. A lot of people will build a like WordPress site where the blog and the, um, the um, like about page and sign up is all standard WordPress and then they'll have a page that's the application page and that start kicks off a React app. Um, people will also do a lot of headless WordPress where you have the WordPress site that's kind of hidden behind a like node application or a static HTML site. And so WordPress is just the CMS, there's no theme and then you have like Next.js or Gatsby for the front end. Um, that's like a whole React app and maybe it has other, you know, some of the data comes from WordPress, some of it might come from a different CMS, some of it might come from Shopify, whatever, right? It's the idea of like a Jamstack site. And so those are generally React sites and may, may or may not use WordPress as the backend. So React starts to get to why we need developer tool. Uh, we generally write in JSX uh, React uh, which isn't JavaScript, we can't ship it to the browser. But whenever, whether we're using React or not, we want to optimize our code. Like JavaScript, you have to be loaded in the browser, so we want to like remove the empty spaces and do other optimizations. Um, and that's part of our tool set. Um, and we can also have automated testing as part of that tool chain. And so those are things for React, but I like to use that as a practical way to get at, like, why do I have this long list of stuff? Like, why can't I just build a website? Um, like this is for writing code for WordPress. Like this is a list of things. And we're gonna cycle through all of them in this talk and get back to the React stuff. But it's important to keep in mind that this is optional. If you wanna build a WordPress site by installing WordPress plugins and themes on your managed host and using a page builder, great. That's easy. Like that's how pluginmachine.com is built. Um, it's been fun to do that. Most of my day, like my work is building, like writing code for like WordPress sites and plugins. Um, takes a lot more work and also a lot more stuff, but we'll get into why and what the advantages of these things are. Having an IDE, um, local development environment, dependency management, automated testing. I don't know, this was all in the blog post. All of these things we're gonna get through here. Starting with like IDE, this is integrated developer environment. So you can modify code in your WordPress site or your WordPress plugins, it's all open source. Um, and it's not just open source, it doesn't require compilation. Like PHP and JavaScript. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about like transpiling like JSX to JavaScript, but it's not like we have to compile the code as, like we were writing C programs or for example, before we ship it. That's something that PHP and JavaScript do for us. Like in the, they have their own compiler. So theoretically, we could just edit the code in Notepad or whatever. Um, we generally use an IDE because it has a code editor with syntax highlighting and has plugins that know if your code is wrong or not. And, you know, have little red squigglies when you make mistakes and, um, you know, uh, have a terminal built in and maybe a MySQL editor built in, right? Um, so I really do recommend if you're writing code for WordPress that you use an IDE. I use VS Code. I used to use um, PHP Storm. Um, I also like Atom. There are a lot of these 
whatever works for you, you should use. Um, but I like VS Code because uh, the extensions like that it has are just really good and it kind of runs anywhere. Like you can run it in the cloud, but the app, like the application is on your screen, you can run it as a website. I mean, it's really neat. It runs inside of GitHub now. Um, I used to use PHP Storm, which by the way is the, the other two on this list are free and open source. PHP Storm is not. Um, PHP Storm is part of JetBrains. Uh, you gotta add a lot of extensions to VS Code to get it to be as powerful as PHP Storm. PHP Storm just out of the box does everything you need for PHP and JavaScript development, basically, and WordPress. Um, but it's sort of heavyweight, it's not cross compatible. Um, and so I switched to VS Code a while ago. Atom's also good. I just don't use it, don't know that much about it. Um, Sublime, NetBeans, there's just a bunch of these things out there. Uh, but those are the ones I've used the most in like. Um, does anybody have questions up till now before I go to the next topic? I promise to stop between topic groups. I'm not reading the chat. Um, yeah, yeah not there. there's nothing else in the chat. Okay, cool. Um, so let's move on to the next section of this, which is local development. Um, when you're doing like WordPress development, you need to have a WordPress to run your code. Uh, so whether you, if you're doing plugin development, there isn't really a live site. Um, but if you're doing plugin development for a, like plugin development for release versus you're building a custom plugin, you're going to work in a custom theme for a site, you don't want to break production. You want to be able to make changes to the code without people who go to the website seeing it. Um, and you want to be able to like work on things with Git um, in, for a while without it, you know, in separate environments. So local development gives us that isolated environment to work in. Um, but we can also automate the setup of it so that way it's consistent. So I don't have to spend time, uh, you know, working on getting everything set up more than once. I can script it. And then all the developers are working from the same place. So they say it doesn't work. It's like, I know that they set things up correctly and they can, and how they will see errors and these things because I set it up as part of the project. So, so it saves time and it's more consistency um, to have a local development and environment. And you know, you're not relying on a server on the internet, but like FTP software, the code changes up to it over and over again to see if it works. It's just running on your computer. There's a ton of great solutions for this. Um, there are WordPress like GUI apps where you can just point and click and do this. Somebody mentioned local WP earlier. Um, super simple, desktop servers, the old favorite, also great, um, where you can click and add WordPress sites like blueprints to that you can pull in presets for sites um, and all the like test things that are kind of neat to have uh, when you're doing local development. People use virtual machines as well. VVV is a popular choice. Homestead is the uh, Laravel virtual machine uh, local development uh, platform, but the link there is to an article about how to use it for WordPress because um, it's PHP in my seat. Um, Docker is a great option. It's what I use. Um, Docker is an automated system for provisioning containers like fake computers inside of your computer. Um, you need a tool to orchestrate all those together. Uh, Docker Compose, for example, Kubernetes, et cetera. Docker Compose is the simplest. Um, and you know, you the configuration is one file of YAML. Um, uh, that's what I like. This link here is to the WordPress getting started docs and has an example file, which we'll look at something similar in a second. Um, WP Local Docker works on top of Docker Compose um, and is for like full site development. It's built by 10up. It's what is used at 10up for like all the site local development environments for sites. Um, Lando is a Docker Compose utility for uh, web application development that has, this is a link to the WordPress docs. Uh, WordPress ENV is a Docker Compose system for WordPress development uh, built as part of Gutenberg. Um, 
I, as I said, I use Docker Compose most of the time. Uh, not 100% of the time, but most of the time. It runs anywhere? So there's a, you know, at installer application that you download for Windows or Mac and double click some things or you install it from the command line. In Linux, um, you can use it in GitHub Actions, you know, you're running your tests in the cloud. VS Code dev containers are based on it. So that allows you to simulate your local environment inside of VS Code or in GitHub. Now it's in beta, I haven't used it yet, but uh, you can like run WordPress inside your GitHub repo. Um, some plugins have started to add this. Um, and VS Code and Docker Compose can work together to like run in the cloud, um, which I have done where the code and the like Docker is running in like AWS, but then you're opening it up on your desktop computer. Um, and like, so that's like why I like VS Code and Docker Compose together. Um, but Docker Compose, like the configuration is a file, right? I can just give that to whoever it's like part of the code base. And as the code, as it changes, those are Git commits in my code base. Um, it's also like infinitely extendable. There are so many Docker services that already exist that I can install from Docker files, or I can just write my own Docker file. Like a Docker file, you're like, you can start at nothing. You can start at a version of Linux or Mac or like Windows. And like, you can start at Ubuntu, you can start at bare metal, like you can start at WordPress, wherever you need. So it's infinitely extendable. Let's look at what this looks like, this one YAML file. I'm gonna show a lot of code examples as I go through here. Um, there's a plugin when I link to in the beginning and the end um, that has uh, like all this code in it, basically. So you can see it working together. Uh, this is a Docker Compose file for WordPress. It's designed to work with that uh, plugin there. Basically, it, this one has two services. One is WordPress, so it just pulls in the latest version of WordPress and you don't have to think about uh, PHP and PHP extensions and all that stuff. It's just configured as part of the open source project. Um, right, that we're pulling in the latest version of WordPress. Then I'm gonna just, from my local system, I'm going to say like the code that's in the root directory of my file, like my Git repo, that's my bug. So just put it in the bug directory. I can map themes, I can map whatever. Um, this doesn't require having like the actual WordPress code base. It's included. You don't need a WP config file. Like when you look in the uh, example code, I'm just setting up some environment variables here for like the user, like the, the, the uh, database. And then the database is just another service, um, which I'm saying now use MySQL 5.7. I could have said MySQL 8. I could have said MariaDB. Um, and then I'm setting up similar like the same username and password. So that way it works together. Um, so those are like the minimum things for uh, to make this work in Docker Compose. And then I can just type Docker Compose up D, up slash D, and it just works. Like I have a local development environment that opens up on localhost 6100. I can keep going with these. I can add more services. So the beginning of this file is literally the same as the previous one. It's actually the same thing. Then we add a WP CLI container. It's another just image that exists out on Docker Hub is all these WordPress CLI containers. Um, pretty much the same thing being done in terms of mapping uh, things over. I map a, a database directory for doing things like imports, having like the, that there. Um, and that gives us the ability to like run WP CLI commands without worrying about if it's installed on the, host com on the computer or not, uh, that whatever developer is working on the project has. Um, we will get to automated testing very soon in this discussion. Um, and one of the things that we'll talk about, which is complicated, is testing, running WordPress unit tests with WordPress and MySQL. Um, well, this is a special uh, container that skips having to set that up on my local machine. It just runs it there. It needs a database. so. We just give it a WordPress, you know, a MySQL database again. So like, this is a new environment that has two different databases, one server, one CLI application, one special testing container, and 
this is like a hundred lines of code or less. Um, and it's super, you know, any changes that you make going on Git on, uh, in your Git and anybody who downloads the project can just read the readme, see how to start this up. They don't need to know how it works under the hood. Questions about the topic of local development? Going once. There's a question in the chat. How difficult oh. is it to come up to speed on Docker Compose? Yes. So here's the thing. Getting your head around Docker is like a big thing. Learning how to like write a Docker file, that's a whole thing. You don't need to know any of that. Um, if you are using Docker Compose, like if I ask you to, hey, Kate, can you work on this plugin that has a Docker Compose file? You need to go to docker.com and find the installer, which is like a point and click installer for Docker. And that includes Docker Compose. Uh, Docker Compose is slowly moving into Docker itself. It used to be a thing you have to install, now it's included in the installer. And in the near future, roughly now, like they're getting rid of the, like there's a sub command of Docker called Compose, um, but older things require the Docker Compose command. So, you download that application, that installer application from docker.com and you have Docker running on your computer, including Compose. And in order to get your site up and running, you need to read the readme that has the one command that you run up to correctly bring this up. Um, Lando and WP local de uh, dev, which I linked to earlier, also like download Docker, download that tool and run it. So what does it take to get up to speed? Not that much. What does it take to get up with like writing your own files and extending it? Yeah, that can be a bit of a learning curve, but just being able to use it uh, based on somebody else's setup. And this is part of the value. You know, somebody on your team can set it up or, you know, it comes with plugins that uh, my machine spits out. And um, then you don't have to make sure that every single person on their, your team knows like to install two different databases or something like that. I hope that answers the question, John. We hope it doesn't, but that's a great question. Oh, thank you. Awesome. So let's keep moving. Dependency management. I'm jumping around a lot. I'm gonna go in circles. This is a lot of different stuff that gets put together. Uh, so uh, yeah, David wrote about like Lando as being a great place to start for sure. But basically where I started with this. Um, Dependency management, these are programs that help add dependencies to your code. They do a little bit more than that, uh, which we'll get to in a second, uh, you know, but that's their core problem that they started with. And uh, for PHP, we use Composer. And for JavaScript, we use NPM or YARN or PNPM. Uh, so Composer. We'll get back to NPM in a bit. Uh, this can add packages to your plugin or your site. Um, you can use dependencies from packages. That is a, you know, a tool like NPM JS where you get people can publish packages that can be installed into PHP. Um, yeah, projects. Uh, if your PHP project is a site, right? We're talking mainly about plugins here, but. If you're building a site, you might install a dependency that way. But more likely, you want to install like plugins and themes. And so there's WP packages or W packages. And uh, that allows you anything that's in WordPress.org slash plugins or WordPress slash or dot org slash themes um, can be installed through Composer that way. Um, it can also like run scripts for you. It has like a basic script runner. So if you have a complicated test command or build command, you can put that into a composer script and it's like composer run test. Um, and also you can have it run scripts like after you install or update. Uh, it also does PHP auto loading, which we'll talk about in a sec. Um, again, if you have the slides open, you can click on that link to see the installation instructions. Um, for Windows, it's like a download in the XE file. For Mac and Linux, you follow there's instructions that change for every release to do it from the command line. And then make sure you do this last step so that way you can type composer 
instead of like compose or far or whatever. Uh, that's important. So I will assume that like that's all done. And with Windows, I'm a Windows guy. Uh, one of the things I like about Windows is I don't have to do that for Compose. It's a lot of other reasons. Um, so Composer.json file gives you the, uh, you know, the configuration for Compose. Like this is NPM uses package.json, Composer uses Composer.json. This is super basic from our example plugin that I'm gonna look at in a minute. Um, note that the type is WordPress plugin. Um, if you're doing a whole site, then you can tell it by default depend that uh, dependencies in Composer go in a vendor form, which isn't where WordPress plugins go. So if you're doing a whole site, you can say, hey, if the type of the package is WordPress plugin, put them in WP content slash plugins slash theme. That's like WP content slash plugins. And if the type is WordPress theme, it's another type of package that Composer knows about. Um, then you know, put it in like a theme string. You can do things like, hey, this plugin or package is only gonna work in this range of PHPs. So like, don't try and install it in PHP 5. As I said, uh, Composer can also manage your auto loader. So in PHP, uh, to use a class, like the file with that class has to be included. Um, back in the day, we would write manual include statements. Oh, that always screwed me up. Um, you don't know which order to include classes in. You don't want to include too many at the wrong time. And so like that you don't need. And so an autoloader is how it's generally done in modern WordPress PHP development is you stick to an agreed upon standard. Here we're specifying PSR4 standard uh, where, and that dictates like where the files go and what they are named for each class. One class per file, uh, the name, of the file is the name of the class, and then the namespaces are used to set up the directories names. Um, and then PHP, because the autoloader is registered, knows like how to uh, like how to include those files, like the class what it's called. It's not already included. So that's great. Um, this is an example, and then that's a blog post I wrote explaining this concept a little bit more uh, about namespaces and autoloaders, how to use them with WordPress plugins. Uh, so that was talking about uh, Composer for dependency management um, in PHP land. Similar uh, to Composer is NPM or Yarn for uh, JavaScript, similar. To <laughs> and um, the we can, so just like Composer, we can use it to like install packages, right? And um, uh, so that might be like a component library. That might be an API client, might be utility functions. Um, so we can run scripts. Oh, this should be under here uh, as well. So we can use it to like install packages like Babel and Webpack and then like use them to transpile JSX to uh, JavaScript or to optimize JavaScript or optimize images or generate HTML, whatever. Um, some packages will put their like configuration in uh, package.json. Uh, this is a link to installing Node. It's a download a installer for Mac or Windows or whatever. Um, point and click through that. And then you can install Yarn if you would like to use Yarn as your package manager, which I generally do. Um, just using NPM, which is installed when you install Node. So basic package.json for a WordPress plugin. We're going to get to WP scripts in a second. It does a ton of the heavy lifting for us in WordPress development, but uh, we have dependencies, we have dev dependencies, um, not a ton of difference between them in this day right now. Uh, we just tell us some basic things, but we have the scripts runner where we can write npm run script build, and it does this. Here we can say yarn build, and it does that, All right? Questions about Composer and VM before I move to the next section? Nope, okay, cool. What are we doing on time? Yeah, we're doing it. 
Okay, so automated testing. Uh, this is, when I talk about automated testing, I like to start with just some tests that sort of shows what it is. In these, imagine that somewhere in my code, I have this brilliant function uh, that adds two numbers together. It's, it's a basic example. We'll get to smoke that in place. And I wanna make sure that this actually works the way that it does. So maybe I will have a test here uh, that says, where I run that, I call that function, and I does does it give me the expected output? You'll see this is an assert equals. So testing is about writing these assertions about your code. Like as your code runs, can I assert that it has the expected output? So four is the expected output, and then this is the actual result. And so if this is true, it passes. Like if these two things are equal and if not, it fails and that shows me that I have a defect. Um, so automated testing can def like just define your development in terms of, you can write a bunch of tests. It's called test-driven development. It's one of the ones test series where you have tests in advance that fail in a port, you know, in a branch on Git. And then as you do development, you make more of your test pass. Um, also, uh, when you do development, you have all your old tests. So if you make some changes and it still adds the feature that you need, but it also breaks a bunch of tests, you know, don't merge that, go back and fix those. Um, a great use of this is for like security vulnerabilities. Um, if you're working on a plugin and somebody reports a security vulnerability, reproduce it using a test. Show how to do it with the test. Um, and then uh, fix it, so then that test passes. Right, like a test that fails because it's it's vulnerable, um, and then fix it, and then passes, and then you have uh, something to make sure that you don't accidentally create that uh, vulnerability again. Um, it makes clear how the code works. It's like cheap documentation. Uh, if you don't know how to do something with code, like look in the test, see how it works there. Um, I tend to use tests for like debugging mistakes. Like I have an error in my code, I don't know why. I'll write a bunch of tests. Till I can figure out why it's happening, then I can test. Um, I can just go through each individual little piece and test that the output is what I expect it to be. And it's not, so then I have to make that work and then get to the next part of the problem. Um, and then I don't, then I test the cover that I don't make the same mistake again. Sometimes you can use it for like profiling performance. People will run tests and see, record how long they take uh, and make sure that it doesn't take longer in the future or they might write like performance specific tests. Um, you might be able to surface like accessibility issues. Uh, so that's cool. Um, so what are some reasons to use automated testing uh, just for the long-term like healthier project? We use a PHP unit uh, to run tests and write tests in, uh, in PHP. Um, you can use it with or without the WordPress test suite, which we're gonna do in a second here. Um, here's a good composer.json for using PHP unit. Um, you'll notice that I have two different uh, test commands that call in different configuration files. Um, one is, uh, so I'm breaking up into uh, unit and integration tests or WordPress tests. And this distinction is that unit tests don't have dependencies. You should be able to test your code in like little bits of code in isolation. Um, and these can run real fast with that because they don't require like setting up WordPress first and clearing out the database. They're limited because they don't have WordPress. Some things like you need to like to test if something's coming in and out of the database correctly, like store it in a MySQL database, read it from a MySQL database. Those tests take more work to set up uh, and to run. So like, I like to separate them into two things. They both have validity. Um, these are some of the, like, just the utilities that I add to make testing easier uh, as well. And we can specify those in what version with the composer. Um, so getting back to that kind of distinction there for a little bit between unit tests and integration tests in WordPress is like, this is a class here that's like a URL generator. Say I'm calling, I have a, remote API and the base URL, like the URL of that API could change if it's not environment. Um, but like the endpoints are the same. So I'm gonna write a URL generator class that just combines like base URL with uh, 
Oh yeah, oops, that's a syntax error. I'm missing the rest of the constructor where it would assign base URL to like this to this. Um, but like, let's just, and that's the thing. If this was a real test that I was running, like real code developed that I was doing, it would be like, hey, syntax error. And this thing that I didn't even think, like, oh, Josh, like you wrote that, correct? Like, no, I, I, I skipped two lines of code before I shipped this. Like if this talk had unit tests somehow, like if this was an actual WordPress code, like this stupid mistake that I made here that everybody makes, like no big deal, forgetting to finish writing the constructor. Like in PHP 7.2, you don't really, seven or eight, eight, sorry, assignments, you don't really need this even. Um, but I would have had like that quick test where it just threw an error and it wouldn't even have gone into this. And then I wouldn't know, happens to me all the time. I love tests. So, but what this is doing is it's comparing the input the expected output to the, in, you know, when I call it. Um, like basically does this then slash API. That's what this should do. So to make sure that I don't have any syntax errors, that's great just by running it. And also that the output is correct. Um, now unit testing gets limited. Like what happens if my code calls a code from, from WordPress core? Like calls a function from WordPress core. Um, and that can be an issue, right? Right, if this URL, like we have to insert a post first in some part of this URL generation. So that's where BrainMonkey, which is a link here to the documentation, is a mocking library that can works with classes uh, and functions where you can say to it, hey, WP insert post is a function that doesn't exist because we're not loading WordPress, but I need it. And I need it to return an integer. So just always return one. And so as a result, this test, and like, don't test WordPress, uh, test your own code, but just showing how this would work. You would be able, even though in your unit test environment, WP insert post isn't defined, to insert a post and then get back the number one. Like assert it's numeric or assert, say, one equals the result. Of and so that's cool. And I, you know, if I have a class where I'm like, that adds a hook, and has a callback in there, um, potentially you'd use that to like mock out add action. Um, or you separate the two into two classes and one has a unit test, one has an integration test. But integration tests, which we load WordPress with, we could just do, like we just use WP insert post. So a lot of times in WordPress, you're developing code that like uses WP insert post or WP query or WPDB, and you should try and write that in a way that you can write, use unit tests, some of it's isolated, use some mocking. And at the end of the day, like there's nothing wrong with having integration tests that use the WordPress database. And uh, I think having, that's better. Like a lot of people maybe are attached to this idea of unit testing as being better, cleaner, whatever. Like, I don't know, it, it's WordPress, just do it. Like use the database and like, don't like, this slide is filled with a lot of assumptions that don't exist in the real world, um, right? Like I'd rather use the API that's actually being used instead of faking it. This is a blank blue slide. Uh, and then let's switch to JavaScript. Uh, this is similar to the um, test that we looked at before, but it's, this is JavaScript. So same kind of function here. Um, and we're expecting the result of two plus two to be four, right? That's kind of what JavaScript tests look like when we're using Jest. Um, before we get too much into JavaScript testing, let's talk about WordPress scripts. Again, uh, I showed it earlier that it was being used in package.json. Uh, one of the things it does is run tests and configure Jest to run our tests, which is just great, right? Like. Never try and set up Jest on your own. Always use Create React app or WordPress scripts. Uh, WordPress scripts is kind of like the Create React app for WordPress. Um, that sets up all everything, including testing, linting. Um, it compiles, transpiles, probably a better word, your uh, React, whether you're doing block development or using React in any of the other ways I was talking about earlier. Um, like you can use it for admin pages or front end. But normally, use like create React app or any other sort of standard React setup. 
one of the things that's going to happen is it's going to compile your JSX to JavaScript to optimize for the browser, but it's also going to bundle in the dependencies, for example, React into your builds, into your build files. And that's a problem in WordPress because you don't want to have two copies of React on the page. It literally doesn't work. Um, there's a lot of like shared dependencies that, that you can use, like WP components, uh, WP block editor, right? All these different things that you can use in Gutenberg, especially. Um, you don't want to have your plugin load React or like Gutenberg components, but you need to deter, like make sure those are loaded in the correct way. And we've always had this concern in WordPress, and it's why in, we don't load jQuery inside of our plugins, like we don't bundle jQuery with our plugins. Uh, we say like when we register our JavaScript, we say one of the dependencies to jQuery or whatever. So we still do that the same with uh, WP scripts. It generates this file, an assets file. And so it'll say like, hey, load React. It'll be one of those assets or WP components or something. Um, and so that way like React isn't in your bundle, but you know it's on the page and you're not causing compatibility issues with core or with uh, other plugins. Uh, like Yoast uses some of these WordPress packages, for example, um, and you wanna be able to use them without having compatibility issues or say like React. Um, so WordPress scripts can run your tests, but it can also do a lot of other cool stuff. Um, we talked a little bit about compiling JavaScript earlier. Um, but we definitely want to do this because we can use JSX, TypeScript, for example, to write our JavaScript ES6, um, and then have it compile down and optimized uh, both your JavaScript and your CSS together. JSX um, is work React's templating language. It's not required for building blocks, but like I would write my blocks in JSX. And JSX is sort of a mashup between HTML and JavaScript. Uh, that saying JavaScript's a great language for writing business logic and HTML is a great language for writing HTML. Um, great, because it's a UI library, it generates HTML. So write HTML in something that looks like HTML and we'll sort of smush them together. What does this look like? Here's a function, very basic React function in JSX. Um, this is almost HTML. One difference is you can't use a class or for in because like those are like meaningful keywords in JavaScript. So instead of class, you're a class name. Uh, if we were doing like the label element for a form, you need to use for attribute in HTML, you use HTML for. Um, but you use this function this way, right? It has one prop message. So I just pass it like this. And then this becomes this HTML. So uh, React dynamically builds this in real time and you, know, you change the message and this changes here. Uh, this is the same at the top, but this is showing kind of what, uh, what this is an abstraction of. Like all of this kind of confusing code here is react.createElement. And like, that's what happens in the transpilation process. It goes from being this thing, which you know, looks like HTML, and I can put some logic up here if I need to before return, to this thing, which I, I think it's like a nested loop of stuff. Um, and so that's why we use JSX. Um, when we test JavaScript, we, especially React, um, there's a lot of ways to do this, but don't, don't stray too far. And, in the React side, especially because um, the WordPress tooling for React has gotten really good. And, uh, and I should say the PHP stuff has gotten a lot better. The work that um, like with the Yoast polyfills library that's uh, been done and everything that Tanya is doing in there it, for PHP core, like that's helping everybody. Um, so I don't wanna say this is purely the Re React side, even though that's where we are in the talk. But I think that the developer tooling for WordPress has gotten a lot better thanks to the core team and everybody working on both Gutenberg and the PHP side. Um, so with React, um, Jest works great for React testing. It's part of WordPress scripts. Um, 
I do also recommend having like a test uh, runner. So we'll show this in a second. Uh, testing library React is great. Uh, does a lot more than just Jest can do. Like Jest is designed to be used with different uh, testing frameworks. It's JavaScript, everything's super modular. Uh, I have a whole other talk about this. I'm gonna show some examples from it in a second. But uh, you can go there and see the slides from it. Um, I do that at WordCamp. Uh, so here's a package.json for a WordPress plugin that's got everything. So here are some WordPress dependencies, different packages from Gutenberg that you can, that are being used in the example code. Um, WordPress scripts, testing library, all of the different commands to run, like make this work real easy. Uh, here's some tests. Um, these functions like describe it, like that's coming from Jest, whereas most of the stuff's coming from testing library. Um, these are definitely like integration testing. Like um, you can use Jest to do like one plus one equals two type stuff. And like, if I have utility functions, I'll use Jest to like, you know, I have a function that finds like something in an array. I'll like use Jest to test that. But for the most part, what I'm using just for is um, do my components work as expected, my React components that go in my block or whatever. Um, two types of tests that I like to use uh, snapshot, uh, I like to use just for. The first is a snapshot test. What this does is store like HTML, the render of the component in a like file in your code base. And so the first time you run it, and then that gets added to Git. And then in the future, you have to commit to changing that. So if I run this test again, and something about like the output of editor with these arguments here has changed, the test will fail and it will show me what has failed. It'll be like, hey, before the class was X, and now it's Y. And maybe that's the change that I was supposed to make. So I would you know, accept that, have it rewrite the thing, and now it's in the pull request when I make the change. It's somebody else who's reviewing my code has to look at that and go, oh, I see why the snapshot had to be updated. Or they might see a snapshot up here and go, hey, that shouldn't have happened. Well, you know, the snapshot might fail and you might not, you go, okay, shoot, I have a problem here. Um, so snapshots are great for preventing regression. Um, and this is a function of testing library React. There are other, but, ways to do it, but it's not something you do just with Jest. Um, we're using this render function from, and uh, you know, spec container to match an option is all we're calling to kind of do all that. Um, the other thing that we're doing here is we're making sure that the on change function, like this editor component that like does something when passes a new, like it has a value and then passes the value to this on change function when the value changes, like of an input of a form. Um, so this get display by value, this lets us find a form input by its current value. So that uh, right here, I must've been hungry. I wrote this, um, wanted salad. I am vegan after all, that is what we eat. Not true. Um, so we're gonna like find that input and then I'm gonna use the fire event function and to change it. And I'm gonna pass this event object. And then I'm just gonna make sure that it's been called. And I could also write this magic jest.fn function. It's a super cool mocking utility uh, for JavaScript. It records how many times it's been called. Um, I should have written uh, to have been called with to make sure it was called with the right value. So those are just like little ways to uh, like simulate the way that your code works to make sure that it keeps working. Um, so we've been looking at ways where we can run our, our code in various scenarios with these automated tests and see if it works the way that we expect it to. Uh, code quality analysis is kind of the opposite. It parses your code. It doesn't run PHP with PHP or JavaScript with JavaScript. It parses it however it does. And, um, detects likely issues, um, right? So like you can use a linter uh, to check like, are there, is it following the right coding standards? 
you know, are we putting spaces where we're supposed to put spaces or no spaces where we're not supposed to put spaces? Are there like bad smelling patterns used? Uh, is the code using deprecated functions? Like that's something in WordPress we wanna look out for. It's like, are we using a version of a function that like we're not supposed to use anymore, we should change. Like, wouldn't it be cool if we had a utility that could just tell us that. Um, there's also static analysis. Uh, this predicts compile time errors. So uh, with PHP now, we can like put in types for arguments of our functions or variables. And uh, it can, so like things like PHP stand uh, can look for that. Um, Code sniffer is a linter for PHP and uh, there's a lot of extensions for it. Um, for example, the WordPress standards for code sniffer extension. Um, if you want to make your code look the same as core's code, that will help you do it. Uh, and this is a cool extension that will like make sure that your code is compatible with the, range, the correct range of PHP. So with automated testing, we can run the tests in different versions of PHP. And maybe it fails in 7.1, not 7.2, and you've learned something. You could also scan the code for likely problems. It'll tell you, hey, this is what PHP 7. Two very different approaches to the same problem. Neither of them are perfect, uh, right? Uh, so these different layers, automated testing, unit tests tell you some things, but not everything. Integration tests tell you a lot of different things. And then sometimes you don't have a lot of tests, but you have a lot of scanning. Hopefully that covers your errors. Um, all of these things you can run locally, uh, but you might also want to run them automatically in the cloud. And this kind of give, this gives rise to the like CI CD idea, continuous integration, continuous deployment. So you can have pipelines that run uh, in the cloud, uh, you know, when you make a change to your Git code. And you should be able to at least test and analyze the code. And depending on how much tests and analysis you have, you might require a code review. You might automatically merge it if the pipeline passes. Um, and then once the merge happens, you can use another pipeline to like rebuild it, do the client, like double check the test, and then deploy it to your servers. Sure. That's a whole different topic there, the CD part that I'm not covering. Um, like that could be a fun talk. Um, a lot of services for this. It's built into GitHub and GitLab, uh, Circle CI, everybody seems to use a lot. Um, I haven't in a while. There are uh, some WordPress specific tools. Branch CI is a CI CD platform for WordPress uh, that I know is restarting soon. They don't accept new customers, but they will. Um, which is awesome, new ownership. Um, that link to BuddyWorks is a link to their like WordPress tools uh, section. They have a ton of cool stuff for like deploying web applications and tests, running pipelines and stuff that work uh, with different WordPress hosts um, as well as just anything. So uh, we're checking out Buddy. GitHub Actions are neat. Uh, they can run like, uh, in this case, whenever you push to your repo. You can say whenever there's a pull request, whenever there's a new tag, run this and push it to github.org, right? The plugin. Uh, like 10 up has that uh, deploy action that can deploy your plugin to wordpress.org for you. So you don't have to, which is great. Um, so the so this is an action that runs unit tests in four different, three different versions, PHP. Uh, so it's going to run three times using this for, you know, whatever version is here. Uh, it's going to do composer install, and then it's going to run your test. So this is another way to do like developer automation, but this happens in the cloud every time you make changes. Okay, so according to this slide, it is live demo time. Um, it's about 710, so we do have a good 20, 30 minutes. Uh, does anybody have any questions before we switch screens? Questions, comments, concerns, things you'd like to add, things you'd like to see. David? I guess I have a question on how you use WordPress scripts. Um, the default config for WordPress scripts is pretty block edit editor oriented. Um, and I was just wondering if there was any sort of uh, things that you like to change regularly or things that um, you think you know are bad, but you shouldn't change kind of thing, sort of what, do yeah, you do you know, let me go into my lab. Let me start the live code part there. Okay. Um, Cause I can answer cool. that with code. And uh, if uh, this is like the 
code that I'm going to be looking at. Okay. Uh, I think that's a private repo still. Is it? Oh, no. That was a mistake. Hold on. Okay. Um, thanks for letting me know that. We will do this. Um, yeah. Stop screen share. Great. Uh, now it should be public. Awesome. Um, cool. So this has a, is also open in my VS code, which is a better way to do this demo. But y'all can check it out there. Thank you for pointing that out. There is a whole readme that explains all of this stuff for you, how to run it, how to use it. Um, the question that was asked before was about customizing um, WP scripts. So WP scripts doesn't require is an abstraction over web packing by a and so you don't have to add your own webpack config file, but if you do, it'll use that instead. And this, so this is my webpack config, and I do import like the default from WordPress. And I am using object spread to like anything that isn't in here, like anything that I don't specify, I just use the defaults, right? So this is a cool way to like most of the stuff we get from WordPress. The thing that I change. Uh, because by default, what it is looking for is index.js is your block. And so if you have one block and you're doing a very basic block plugin, which this is not, right? This is a plugin with lots of stuff to it. That's cool, right? You're a plugin that loads one block. That's all it does. You don't need to do any of this. That's part of what's so cool about uh, WP scripts. But if you do need it, um, you can extend the webpack config. So I have this like a uh, file that's very easy because then this needs to be the one thing that gets changed, but this was imported. Um, if I split my screen here, All right, we see entry points here. This, you'll notice this kind of like, I have admin here, it's this contains so these are like React pages that are using, uh, oh, not this one. Uh, this one, right? Like this is a little React app. And so this is loaded uh, from that directory admin slash whatever this is. And then the blocks are in here in blocks. So this is a totally custom configuration based on what I've decided. And it's going to, so this gives me like one file to modify that's real easy and doesn't have a bunch of other code in it. Um, but what it's doing is creating this map of entry points. Um, that it knows to look here, like to this index.js build that. And then that becomes in the build folder. I have that here. And so I get each of, like in this case, I have one admin page that I'm using WordPress scripts and two blocks in using this like entry. And that's really kind of the only thing entry and output that I've over, overridden. I've also added like a CSS loader um, I'm able to get multiple input entry points and outputs. And then each one has their own assets file as well. So I was talking about earlier, uh, that when I pass to WP and Q script, this array of attributes, I can like get the WP polyfills, WP block it, dependencies that are needed. Um, so that's how I overwrite it. But what's neat about it is it's just webpack, right? You can read the docs for webpack and override any of the stuff. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess um, two things that I've been wondering about that I'm trying to figure out whether it's sort of kosher or not, because I just play a JavaScript developer on the internet, like didn't go to you know school for this or anything. Um, yeah. uh, so one, one feature of Webpack that I really like is aliases. Mm -hmm. um, do you see any issues with setting aliases? I know why they wouldn't necessarily include them in WordPress scripts out of the box, but um, I sort of like the the utility and the cleanliness of having a util like a direct one like one path in one spot and not relative paths throughout the app. Yeah, 
Um, it's nice. Like I don't set it up in WordPress, but like it's built into Next, and it's really nice. Okay. Right. Like, yeah, you can do, but like, do what makes sense to you. Okay. In, in terms of like the thing, one of the things that comes out of this is that is a plugin that does the dependency abstraction. That I wouldn't net, like you can, yeah. it's documented how you can extend it, right? Yeah. But don't, that's the kind of place where you could get in trouble yeah. because everybody's supposed to assume that that dependency extraction plugin is being used in Webpack. And yeah. it's being used when you use this dept default config. Yeah. That, that could really cause cross compatibility issues if you mess with it, mess with it wrong. Whereas something like aliases, that's something that only affects your development environment. Yeah. Right, because remember, I, none of this stuff runs on a server. This stuff runs in development. It's not running in WordPress. The other sort of big thing that I go back and forth on is whether or not to use the Webpack provide plugin, uh, mm -hmm. because I just sort of get to the point where if you have a complex application, it has you know dozens of components, re-importing fragment, re-importing use state, at the top of every file doesn't necessarily like at some point that stuff almost becomes like like this like sea of stuff to wade through so i usually pick like my top like five or ten imports and i put them into the provide plugin so that i don't have to import them in every file but i also yeah. don't know if that's like dangerous no okay so here's the potential downside which i don't think applies in wordpress is that one of the reasons why you want to use Word in Webpack in general for front end development or you know, for JavaScript development is that you can do things like having multiple bundles that lazy load code, right? So that way, you know, when you click here, it loads the things that weren't from the first one in terms of dependencies, right? Like you have a React application with three pages and you're only using your component library on page two. It would be cool if page one, like home page, doesn't load all the like dependencies. Then when you go to it, automatically does it, right? In Webpack and React, can kind of build for that kind of thing, um, and that all goes out the window with what you're talking about. Yeah, that's not what we're doing. You're building a single entry, like a single, um, you know, a single entry point bundle for each, you know, for each block or each other use of it of React. Yeah, and. Uh, I have implemented lazy loading in like that kind of dynamic webpack lazy loading with code splitting in WordPress. I'm not sure it was a good idea. Um, I think what you're talking about, make, if it makes your life easier, there isn't a downside to it. As long as you keep in mind that you're losing that ability to like do like bundles, like code splitting across bundles. Well, I, I have it working with code splitting where basically I just set the Webpack public path. I'll create the Webpack public path in PHP. Yeah. Um, and I put it in like a versioned directory instead of build. So build 1.0, 1.1, 1.2. And yeah. I set that as like an, uh, the, the output and then um, just sort of bring it in um, and, and set Webpack public path before running any code. So. Yeah. Sounds good to me. That's what I'm saying. Like, and you're talking, and you kind of sort of said this. Like, you like it's hard to know the difference between like sometimes what you're supposed to do versus what you're supposed to do in WordPress, right? Yeah. Like, I, I could, as I said, like I could call some problems with what you're talking about for a single page web application, but not maybe so much for WordPress. And I think that just like you shouldn't use Create React App, you should use WordPress scripts. Like, this is the specific domain knowledge that's a little. Bit, we have this Venn diagram of skills. It's like React developer and WordPress developer. Yeah, like those are the things that aren't common to both. Um, other questions, or I'm going to go through sort of the same list of things, but show it in uh, in the code base. Uh, let's see how that sort of five. Okay, cool. So um, I talked about IDEs. This is VS Code. This is what I use. Um, you can see one of the advantages is it has a uh, terminal right here built in. I don't have to use it as a separate plugin. It is syntax highlighting all of these different types of things. Um, it should know, like if I change include once to include ones, you see how I get a little red squiggly. It stopped looking like correct. Right? Those are the advantages. I could be editing this code in Notepad, um, but instead I'm using this thing that has 
you know, I have a bunch of extensions installed, um, all these different things. Um, the next thing we talked about was uh, local development. I have a Docker Compose file in here um, for this plugin. If we look in the README, uh, it shows us here um, what the command is to start the local development environment. And somebody asked earlier, like, what do you need to know to get up and running with Docker Compose? How to install it, which is at docker.com slash install. And basically this command, Docker Compose up, and then the flag D uh, keeps it running in the background. So you'll see that it started all of those services that were listed in Docker Compose file. And uh, I should now be able to see a WordPress site here. Um, I was already logged into it. Uh, I have like WPCLI commands that I can execute against it, and things like that. Uh, but this is now a full WordPress site. Um, if I get out of full screen mode, you can see it's running locally on my computer, not uh, in, uh, you know, not on a server. Could be, but it's fine. I think it could run Docker Compose in the cloud. Um, so what else did we talk about? We talked about um, using like Composer here. One of the things that I use Composer for uh, is to install those test dependencies. I believe they are all installed already, but let's just make sure. Um, I'm also using Composer for an auto loader, as I mentioned. So uh, the root namespace here in the PSR4 standard is all of the things. So that means that a class by the name of plugin has to be called in a file called plugin in the root there and use this all of the things namespace. And then if I wanted to say like hooks, I'm gonna have a bunch of classes that add or remove hooks. Um, I would have like register, like say REST API, have a bunch of things that set up the REST API. It's going to go here, but it's going to have to have that namespace defined by um, the uh, directory there. And then, because I have, uh, what is this supposed to be called? REST API. Whatever this is, PHP will know how to load it based on that auto loader that I have registered. It knows that if a class in this namespace with this name exists, it has to be in this file. Those are the rules of PSR4. If you follow them, you can use the autoloader. Um, you can also write your own autoloader. You don't have to use Composer's autoloader. Um, just go to the internet and copy, kind of paste the PSR4 autoloader example. Um, but in my plugin here, the first thing I do at like the plugins loaded hook is check to make sure that it exists and then I include it. Um, honestly, it should be included once. Uh, just in case, but it includes that generated auto book. What's cool about this is with Composer, um, all, any package that I add that uses an auto loader, it uses the same auto loader as my code base. Um, cool. So we talked about Composer, we talked about uh, NPM, and we've kind of touched on this a bit, but uh, right, this is my, um, you know, my test runner. Uh, tells me what are my dev dependencies, right? These are the things for testing. This is a separate utility for like generating a built zip file. Uh, these are like the WordPress scripts there. So cool. Um, let's look at like how these, uh, like how this stuff works. Like for blocks, um, I already compiled the blocks, but that's like a production build. When I make changes to my code, I want to like see that in the editor. So I can just run yarn start now, uh, like that said, it does new rebuild, but you see this is still running. So I can go in here uh, and I can like, these blocks use like the version two of the block API where most of the things are done in this one JSON file. Oh. And this stuff's really neat now because you like tell it what script you want to load in this, and then the PHP 
like this is how I load blocks now. Like this is how I register the scripts. This is how I register the block uh, with this one magical function. Uh, it's really neat. I really love that WordPress has kind of come a long way in terms of like more standards over conventions. Um, and so that loads up this file and I break apart uh, into like an edit and a save. Um, and so if I wanted to like make a change here, if I wanted to like have uh, this work with two different text controls, let's say real quick. And now we're gonna have to, well, this is gonna be two. Like we can get a little bit more complicated in a second here, but we got pose. Now we have these two components um, and that kind of magically snapped out. And if we had like, uh, you now two attributes, all right, message one, message two, Right, like this is gonna take a minute to figure out how to update these, but we could do like pass this down here. Um, asking me if I'm playing music? No, no, I'm not. There's the Xbox in the other room. Um, so I'm gonna need to update this uh, on change message, but I now have like two different um, right, two different air inputs. Um, cool, I got an error. I was hoping I would. Um, what's neat about this in development mode, um, when you look at like a block plugin that's been properly shipped and everything's compiled and um, the error messages can be a pain to read because they're like in the middle of compiled code. When you're in the development mode, you get a map. So that way, when you open these up in the, in the inspector, it looks basically the same. So I can set a breakpoint here, right? Because I just did this real quick. I know it's whatever. And we can, uh, oh yeah, look at this. Like I'm just passing in totally the wrong stuff. It's never gonna work. Um, like this has been made obvious to me through this process that, uh, well, I updated what was expected. I didn't like actually pass the right things down there. Um, right, that is a great example of like using these tools help me get to a mistake faster. Uh, this is still going to be wrong, but I'm not going to spend all day on this other than this is also wrong, like value isn't defined now. Um, it's a, I mean, this is an example of how we use our tools instead of shipping, you know, putting this on a website, like doing the whole build process, I just did it, made a quick change, found my error, um, and now I'm trying it again. Now I've got this far, that looks pretty good. I don't know what the error is this time. Um, Unchanged is not defined, right? Cool. Uh, so we can, like there's still this argument, so it's gonna be like value. Uh, set attributes. I don't want to get into whole like how to do uh, block development in this talk. That would be a whole different talk. Um, three message two. But that should like do what it was that is the world's worst block. But on change is not defined. I thought I was going to change that. I did not save the file. All right, so now I have two controls. Um, I can change them, and like that first thing is still showing. Um, I don't want to do a whole block development video in the middle of all this because uh, that'll take another hour. Uh, let's look at like uh, automated testing, right? Um, I did have my test passing before before I made that change to that thing, but if I run my JavaScript test right now, I guarantee they're fail. Um, 
Look at all these things here. Um, like this is undefined, like that's all this stuff that changed because I, like my tests are no longer valid since I made so much change. And sometimes that's the nature of tests, like you just have to rewrite them. Um, but let's look at what does look like. You saw about half of these earlier in the talk, um, right? Like these now have the wrong inputs to them. Uh, attributes equals, we just need to give it new. And then set attributes is what's going to get this mock function still. But that's what's cool about automated testing is like I made those changes and now I've got this thing. It's like, well, now you like. Does all the stuff still work together? Um, one of the things that's failed here is our snapshots. We can see, you know, like this is what it's looking like now. Um, right, here's my snapshot that failed because this is what's saved in from before where I only had one input. So now it's going like, whoa, look at this. You got a whole nother input there. Um, and that's fine. Like that was the point, right? Like the requirement was add a second input. So um, that's acceptable. So we'll run that again with uh, the U flag, I believe. Yeah, something else. And it'll rewrite those now. F, that's the flag U. So it's going to rewrite those. And I'm not to worry about the other tests. Like, uh, I have an entire talk that I went to earlier that you can see from WordCamp Santa Clarita on that. Um, but now it's like updated these tests. So if we look at the git, the snapshot, if we look at the uh, diff for this file here, you can see what's changed. Um, and if you if that was a problem, you're a code reviewer and you don't agree with the changes, like it's an opportunity to look at that. Um, Let's look at our like PHP testing as well. Feel free to interrupt me as I switch. Josh, yeah, there's a question in the chat if you want to look at that. Oh, I'm not great. sure Thank if you, you answered it or not, but. Uh, what is the question? Let me uh, it's uh, why not run the change through the test scripts? Shouldn't they have caught the error? Yeah, no, I was I asked that question before you went into okay. running the tests. You were you you'd made the change, it blew up, and I thought, wait, why wouldn't we run the test? And I, the question kind of comes from my other life years and years ago as a Java developer, where we would actually alter the tests first before we alter the code. But um, yeah, that's, so that's, that's like test driven development. So I, I kind of withdraw the question. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's, <laughs> it's, right. Right. it's like with test driven, there's test driven development. Maybe what we would do is like add the two inputs to the test, right? Because here we're testing that the test, like the uh, input works. So what you're talking about is like, we would have updated like what the inputs were and added support for the second one and maybe like do a test that there were two elements on the page with input as their type. I might've written those tests first. They would have failed and then I could make changes to the component and have it work. Like uh, I was gonna move on to PHP, but why don't we do it that way, right? This time. Um, Cause this is really neat. Like let's, um, Let's talk about PHP testing and we'll talk about test driven development there. Um, I have two test suites set up here. One's component, to the unit tests. Uh, as I said, no WordPress there. And then um, I believe I'm already, this is, oh, let's follow the instructions. Uh, the, un, the WordPress tests require that special container a special word, you know, container that has WordPress and MySQL in the background. So with this Docker Compose setup, I do this to enter that container. Um, 
and then right, I didn't have that uh, flag D at the end, so it's going to keep running instead of it, you know, drop me into the instead of running it in the background. Um, and so now I can do like composer test WordPress. And it's going to run these tests. So I just wanted to make sure that they work. Um, looking at our unit test, right now I just have this environment test. Um, and I like having these tests that are, you know, you're not supposed to test the framework. Like it doesn't make sense really for me to be testing the WP insert post. We saw this example earlier works. But it does make sense for me if all of my other tests are using a mocking library. I want to have one test that runs early and like it, it fails if the mocking library isn't set up correctly. Um, right. Uh, this is just some tests for the like backwards compatibility polyfills. Uh, so I can prove that they work and I can like go back and like double, like I have a place to debug when they don't. Um, this test that my auto order works, right? Like this class wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't exist. Um, so these are the environment tests uh, for that. And I have a similar environment test in integration testing, where, because remember there aren't mocks. So is WPDB an object? Like can't test with WordPress, but that's not an object. Uh, and can I like insert a post? So, this has, uh, here's a great example of test-driven development, right? Of if I wanted to write this, like just says hi to someone, and then let's, um, you're telling me like, okay, cool, but I need to be able to pass a variable into that. So let's write a test for it. I don't think we have that here yet. Um, or we just add another um, test here. So this is gonna be plugin test, like for that class plugin. Notice that the test file ends in the word test. It's like the default way that uh, it knows to do this. Um, I'm gonna just kind of paste all this stuff to make life easier. Um, so this is code test for that class plug, right? And so what we're doing here is I'm looking at this that. Uh, that class, and I know that my job is to add an argument to this function. It has this like say hi uh, here, and I'm going to make it like say hi, like accept an argument. So I know because like John was saying, like, why don't you write the test first? I'm like, yeah, it's but test driven development. That's a great idea. We're going to like demonstrate that. I'm going to use the code wrong to as if I'd already made the test. Like the change. So plugin equals new plugin. Um, I need, oh, here to see it. It does have that there, that import namespace, insert same, John. And then we're going to call that uh, function, say hi. And I'm going to use, this is now going to fail. This is my unit test here. So let's run it again. There you go, right? The expected output was hi, John, and the actual output was hi, Roy, because I'm doing test-driven development. I would commit this test. I would put in a pull request, and it would fail. People call this like red-green you're going to get like a red thing on your pull request and get home where other systems say like, hey, your tests are passing. So now somebody, you might ask for a quick code review now or somebody's like, yeah, that's the change I want to make. That test describes it. And you put it, update your pull request with the actual change that you needed. Um, that's how PHP works, right? Yep. And so now, I thought that's how it worked. Oh, this is this other test now that's failing. 
uh, because I hadn't passed a thing there. And that is a great point. I'm going to learn like for backwards compatibility issues, this wasn't a good change, right? This is the value of testing. So I just discovered this quick thing. I was thinking about it in one context. I was like, oh shoot, my code already uses it without uh, an argument. So I'll give it a default there. And now it passes all of my tests. Um, CICD uh, was kind of the last thing on the list. I want to wrap up uh, shortly here as we're almost at 745. This uh, one has three GitHub workflows to it. This one, uh, which I think we saw in the uh, I think we saw in the beginning, like in the talk itself slides, this runs just the test, the, the unit tests um, using, um, you know, three different versions of PHP. This runs the tests like in a WordPress test container so that way we can do the integration tests. This runs these JavaScript tests um, and in the Git repo, you can see them running. I think there's actually a problem with the WordPress one, but I'll work on that tomorrow. Um, and you could add as many workflows as you want. So for example, 10 up has like a deploy uh, workflow um, that uh, can push a plug into wordpress.org or you can like package up the zip, put it back somewhere else. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the GitHub Actions ecosystem that you can use. Um, so that brings us back to the end of that list. Um, are there any other questions or I'll wrap up? Renee, are you asking a question? I am looking. I don't see any new ones in the chat. So whoever, anybody have questions? Uh, yes, hold on, there's maybe one coming. And if you want to just turn off your mic and chat, that's fine too. Yeah, so um, anyway, I really appreciate everybody uh, coming out to hear my little spiel. Um, part two is in three weeks on um, December. Renee, Ninth? December. Hold on one second. Six, nine, I, I don't know. I uh, fall it's it's a Twitter Tuesday. It's a Tuesday. Seventh. So seventh. Yeah. It's the seventh. The seventh. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be showing uh, how to like put all this stuff together and build things uh, for WordPress plugins using Plugin Machine. Um, helps with this is a lot of stuff. It helps like sort of stitch this all together and not worry about how to like kind of paste it together. Um. You can I'm follow working. me on Twitter at Josh412 if you have other questions, like just at me with a question, or I can see you three weeks in the next meetup. Um, th thank you all so much for coming out and asking me yeah, questions. Yeah, thank you, Josh. Me talk. It's awesome. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so first of all, awesome presentation, Josh. Um, yeah, thank you. I very, very, uh, one thing, one of my critiques of other meetups and whatever is, they're not very um, nutrient dense <laughs> or content dense. Yeah, you uh, blew me out of the water. <laughs> so, which is which is honestly, really, honestly, kind of a great thing. It's just the timing is wrong for me in the sense that you're like a senior, probably <laughs> in college here, and I'm at like the freshman level. So there was, I mean, I caught small pieces of it, but there was a big disconnect. And so my question is for any of us who are uh, much further behind which maybe i'm the only one but where where can you give me some places to start as the bottom is the is the thing yeah so I'm for like, sure yeah. i like the i like the, <laughs> I like the nutrient dense mm -hmm. um uh metaphor uh, not just because i'm a plant guy but because i yeah. like back in the day when we had like word camps and stuff i would go and i would like cut and paste like the slide link and then like get back to it later right I'd be like like here's some thing that I'll like pin away for later when I need like underscores right uh that's how I always did like word camps like uh and so uh there's the link to the slides that we can put back in the chat mm -hmm. yeah, um this is a great source for cutting and pasting there are a ton of links and I intentionally do something nutrient dense so that way you have a place when you go to play with this stuff in the future you have a place to click and find links nope um but Sorry, uh no. i i would say for sure use the thing that solves your problem right 
like as you said, you're a beginner. Um, you don't need to use all this stuff. And one of the things that comes with being a more experienced engineer is you know when to use and when not to use it. And that sure. can be part of the challenge okay. is you don't need to use all the stuff. Like this plugin, I like jokingly call it everything all of the time because it's like the all of the things that like you don't need all this stuff. Uh, I just mashing it together. It's like a way to test that it all works for me. Um, but if you're writing blocks, learn how to write test driven blocks, right? Uh, if you're writing a bunch of back end code, right, learn how to write PHP tests, right? Uh, learning how to set it up can be a pain in the ass. Like I'm working on a product for that. Uh, but uh, you know, the example code from here can be your um, your uh, place to learn from, like to get good cutting kind of paste stuff. Um, also, like WooCommerce, uh, Jet, um, Yoast. Like just reading their code and seeing how they solve similar problems is part of how I learn. You know, plugins that are not just good plugins, but they've had to deal with all the like random WordPressy stuff over the years. Um, okay. Seeing how they have the stuff set up, that's where I get started. Um, WP Dev Academy is a new class from Alex Stanford, uh, and he uh, he sort of walks through all the stuff. Tanya Monk has a, um, a know the code. Uh, which is a great uh, resource for learning this stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I'll take out those links. I just um, put the know the code in there, but what was the one that you said Alex was? What was his again? WP Dev Academy, I think, okay. was the one that I was referring to. Yeah, with this. Um, I will put this in there. He has a bunch of these like courses on like plugin development that are excellent. Um, and I think that's probably like the short answer to your question. Start there. Um, I would also yeah. say, um, right? Because, like, yeah, like I was even thinking, like, like maybe even going to Udemy and being like, you know, how, how to do WordPress. <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, this is another great place to start because it's okay. surrounded by a ton of other great information. Okay. How to write your first blog, your first blog type. Um, there's also like the LinkedIn learning uh, track. Mm -hmm. There's a couple. Here's the thing that I think is really special about the one that, uh, this one right here, uh, that is, uh, curated by Morden, and the, he does some of the talks, but not all of them. Um, a lot of these follow similar lesson plans, and it's not accidental, as learn.wordpress.org. So you can go through these lesson plans at wordpress.org. Um, these are like, these are both developer and non-developer stuff. Um, and it's just like the outline of different courses, but you can find most of these courses, you know, you have to pay for those, like Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, if you're a member, you can get LinkedIn learning for free through the library. Um, many public libraries, including Pittsburgh's library. Yeah, I'm gonna see if I can look that up. We used to have a, a link on, they changed something. We had a link on our homepage about that. Uh, let me see if it still works. If not, like your Carnegie Library card will let you. Um, yeah, here. So here, I'll put the link here in the chat. Um, actually, my chat's not working. And I was going to say, just these are all great courses, but the people who teach them are also great people to learn from. Like all these folks down here at the bottom, like these are all people that I recommend like following and like taking whatever other courses they're doing and mm -hmm. reading. Um, so like, I think this is a great track and i think that that wp dev academy and know the code like between those three like there's a lot of really good stuff okay here's another list that kevin had made there's yeah, kevin. um from a couple other course providers west boss um i don't know, I don't know some other things oh yeah this is a good list so those are some and then there's front end a couple front end things, some people to follow. I don't think the list has been updated in a little while, but wow. you know, maybe something in there. Okay, still like that's even still like a wealth of information. So of all that you just talked about, um, 
and I, I'm realizing that I may be like, I don't know, maybe in over my head for what I want to do. Um, what, what, which one would you go to first, though? What do you want to do? Um, again, I want to build. I want to build the web. I want to build a website for my company. Um, I want to be able to have, you know, a shopping cart. I want to be able to offer up different thing. You know, um, different different products to like. I have some um, courses that like I'm creating like video courses, you know, and I want people to be able to buy those and whatnot. If someone wants to book um, book me to come to their house and give them an estimate or something like that, you know, I want to be able to have like that. So I want to be able to communicate uh, with them electronically and have them see a calendar of my schedule and, you know, get myself out of some of the, uh, what do you call it, mediocre tasks, mm -hmm. if you will. So I would take those apart. Um, those are all kind of separate things, um, you know, just, and I would also do those as separate projects as well. Um, okay. I mean, launching a site with that much functionality is a little bit time consuming. Uh, you'll never get it launched. That's what I end up seeing personally. So okay. I would get a site up there, have some pages. Then if you want to add um, a, a store, you know, think about if you're selling, are you selling physical products, digital products, memberships? What are you selling specifically? Then look for the best tool for that. I would probably recommend not reinventing any of that stuff. Um, sure. You don't want to write your own shopping cart. I mean, some people do, but I wouldn't think that you at this point would want to do that. Right. So there's a lot of good yeah, shopping carts that exist. Yeah. If I may um, add just something here to his answer, this course was about a tool set to develop plugins, you can build out an entire website without building your own plugin at mm -hmm. all, just by right. using plugins and using themes and so forth. You do, what we saw today, you might not ever, 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 have ever to do build your own plugin, okay. let alone <laughs> use the tools that we just saw. Right. So okay. I just wanted to throw that out there for some context. Mm -hmm. for right. sure. that, no, that's great. That's great. That's great. Yeah, because it just seemed really, really high level, like mm -hmm. way more than I expected from a meetup, I think. <laughs> yes. And yes, you know, WordPress powers quite a bit of the web and there are a lot of different use cases for it. So, you know, while this might be something that you would do eventually, uh, depending on how much time you wanted to spend with it, all of the things that you mentioned wanting to do already exist. If you want to sell physical products, you can use WooCommerce. If you want to sell, um, you know, membership stuff, you can use any number of member plugins. So, you know, I would, I would take it a step at a time. Um, okay. you know, when you get to the point that you decide you want to sell digital products, you know, I would do some research on how to sell digital products with WordPress. You'll see a lot of guides, um, especially I would think from hosting companies, you know, top 10 um, membership plugins, top 10, um, you know, content restriction plugins, even something, you know, you mentioned about the calendar. You don't have to use something with WordPress. You know, I use Calendly. It's a separate service. I can integrate it with my website or not. So I wouldn't also think that WordPress is the answer to all of the things that you want to do as well. So oh, okay. I would just look for the best tool for the job and you do want them to go together. You don't want to have, you know, this year, this year, this year, this year. You, you do want to kind of, it's a balance though, you know, as for finding the best tool for the job and kind of keeping things consolidated for you. Okay. And by the way, real quick, um, what do you pay for the Calendly? I've, I've heard of, I've heard and seen Calendly is free uh, for the main level. Um, I think you get one calendar, I guess, and it's branded. Um, at this point, I think I pay eight or $12 a month and I have the pro version, which integrates with Zoom. So I have multiple types of appointments and people can go there. I can have multiple calendars connected to them. And then it also schedules the Zoom call for me. So it, I, and I, I think I was talking about this with a client today. You have to figure out where you are. And then when you get to a different place, you can do something else. So start with the free version and then you'll know when you grow out of it and you're mm -hmm. ready for the paid version. So I Come use on. Zoom free for a long time, but now I have lots of calls with lots of people all the time. So it's time to pay for it. So 
you know, just, I would say, look at, and this is how you would vet any plugins anyway, you want to look at um, reviews, uh, you know, last updated, is it updated frequently, um, but not too frequently. Um, but, you know, right. reviews, you know, what are people saying about it? You, and this um, is kind of what's a good, what's a good update? um time frame like every so many months um, i don't know that it's a specific there's when you search for plugins it will say compatible with this version of wordpress that's a good indicator that it is a good plugin um also you know it has good reviews and you know updated somewhat frequently but not too frequently so i, I don't know maybe in the past six months it's not okay. a hard and fast rule um, I don't like plugins that are updated, you know, once a week, that's too much. I don't want to update my plugins that much, but also if the developer hasn't touched it in, you know, a year and a half, uh, right. I get a little okay. bit nervous because I don't know what's in there and, you yeah. know. Right. Things, yeah. Have, things have changed in a exactly. year, in the electronic world, things have definitely changed mm -hmm. in, in a year and a half, probably more like six, they've changed in six months. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, there's, and, you know, PHP versions have changed, so you don't know if any, code has has changed to the point that it could be vulnerable like it's you know I, I like to go with plugins that are you know again very reputable um, and you'll you'll find them you know when you when you're ready to search for um, let's say membership membership plugins you're going to find the top membership plugins um, and you'll also see what their support is like um, if they offer a free plan or paid plans is the paid plan in your budget you know those are all things that that kind of come together it's just like you would make any other decision you know like buying a car or so you guys, so there, like, so I can customize what I want to do with the plugins. But then, what you guys were talking about is actually taking the plugins and customizing the plugin and rewriting some of the code behind the plugin. Well, not necessarily. Just making. Josh was talking about making his own. Like, here's how to make my. Like, if he wanted to make his own shopping cart or his own calendar or his own. Um, I don't know, Josh, what I, he, Josh um, had Caldera forms. He built his own form plugin. So he didn't use Ninja forms or gravity forms or whatever. He just made his own. So, you know, this for people who are building from scratch and the, the plugins that exist, and there are many, those were built from scratch. So somebody, we're glad that somebody is building plugins, sure. uh, but not all of us, um, you know, some of us just want to use and or buy the functionality instead of writing it ourselves. Okay. Whoa, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> absolutely. But we are uh, glad that some we have so many people them. on the planet, you know, yes, so sure. everybody can get, everybody can contribute and then you get a yeah. piece of the pie, basically. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, for sure. So yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to put my, con uh, I'm going to put my, contact some of my contact information here in the chat okay great if anybody wants to you know but you know uh, obviously i'm just getting started or, yeah so or connect on LinkedIn. I'm, at a, I'm at a totally different level and i don't want to you know that's kind of what i why i tried to wait to my to the end to really chime in because um you guys were obviously uh playing in the big kid sandbox <laughs> and i think that it always there's always something to learn so it's not it's a, it's a continuum. So yeah, right. I mean, I do get that. I'm just so early on the continuum mm -hmm. compared to what you guys were. You guys were. That's all. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, we're glad that you came. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay. Have a good. Yeah, you too. Anybody else have any last questions or anything? Yeah, I do. Um, this was part one. <laughs> Yeah. Was it? Could you give us a small, like a 30 second teaser on what is in part two? Josh, you want to do that? Yes. I just lost my mute button there. Mm -hmm. So um, I am going to do a very similar talk as a demo of how to use a plugin machine, which is a service that I'm working on that should be available in the next three weeks. Uh, that uh, makes this kind of stuff simpler for plugin development. So if you're building your own plugins from scratch or you're doing like custom plugins, like uh, somebody says to you like, hey, I wanna like build a WooCommerce extension or something like that. Uh, it's a tool that uh, brings all this stuff together uh, for you um, and sets it up for you. So I'm gonna be doing a similar talk where I talk about this stuff, but instead of just like showing you the code and to show you how to do it with plugin machine. Um, so if this feels like it's way over your head, 
Um, it might be that for two reasons. One, like part one, because you're not really looking to do like plugin development, you're looking to like build sites with other plugins, um, then part two probably isn't for you. Um, but if you're like looking to get into writing code for WordPress, uh, or you do write code for WordPress, uh, because you write plugins, you write themes, you write custom code for sites, uh, then part two is for you, if that makes sense. Like even if, even if it's an aspirational goal, like plugin machine helps people learn these things, uh, as well as helps experienced developers not come kind of paste the same thing over and over again. Um, so I would say if you're looking to learn more about like putting together WordPress sites using pre-built plugins and themes, um, part two isn't great for you. Um, Renee had the link to WP Calendar in there earlier. Uh, yes. Daniel was here from uh, WP Live Streams. There is just so much uh, great live streaming WordPress meetup groups out there. Um, find something that, like you know, there's something for everybody. But if you're you can a, join anybody's meetup, any anybody anywhere, they'll they're happy to have you. Yeah, it's one of the good things about the community, right? Like mm -hmm. not everybody here uh, in this meetup is from the Pittsburgh area, and that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, so find a good one for you on the WP calendar, the WP streams link, uh, they pop up in the WordPress dashboard as well, but if and some are good, help desk. So you can look for happiness bar or help desk. Those will be open meetups where there's not a specific speaker, but just people coming and like, I have a question I need somebody to ask. So that's what those, if you look for those, that's what that kind of meetup is. Yeah, free website help. Um, yeah, any help desk, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, what's the link to WP Streams again? Uh, the w what was it? WP Live Streams. Um, I have it in my Twitter. Yeah. But that's, but, I thought that was, what is that? I automatically embed your live stream on your site. Facebook, Twitch, Vimeo, YouTube. So that's that. This WPLivestream.com. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, like that's just a ton of listings for. things to check out in the future but definitely if you you know if you're into, interested in learning more about like writing code and uh for wordpress plugins that uh you know original plugins or extend wordpress but other wordpress plugins definitely come to part two yeah i'm not i'm, I'm kind of wrestling with that whether i want to go down that rabbit hole so far are you familiar with the code snippets plugin mm -hmm. Yeah, so far that's been able to meet most of my needs and I'm thinking, I don't know, I'm <laughs> I'm afraid of getting into plugin development a little too much. I'm, you know, I'm afraid it just might draw me in, but maybe, yeah. maybe it's time, maybe it's time. You uh, could also watch the the video, you know, if, if you're not available that night, you can watch, we'll record it. You can watch the video yeah. after, um, either way. All right. Thank you very much. Yay. Thank you. Anybody else have any last minute things? If not, I'm going to go eat dinner. Yeah, cool. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for coming and hopefully we'll see you in a couple weeks. And if you have any questions, you can chat uh, Josh on Twitter and I will put this video up um, maybe tomorrow, but maybe Thursday and I will tweet it up. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, have, have a great night. night.